You're listening to TGIF Geocaching Radio. It's almost Christmas and Tiny Tim is on a rescue mission. This year, the Seven Days of Geopodmas is a special daily audio saga continuing the adventures of Tiny Tim and the Treasure Troops. Be sure to catch up and follow the events from day one. Geopodmas Day 5 begins now. With a swirl and a poof, Tiny Tim appeared. He sat, resting on a small patch of dirt, surrounded by some grass and a few trees. It was very calm. Ahead of him was a slight downward hill, and what looked like a road bending away and off to the right. Tim heard a little rustle, a very small clatter. He looked around for the source of the sound, and then spotted a little figure bumbling and tumbling just ahead of him down the slope. He hit a root that was stretched across the ground, and there the wobbly, marble-covered figure rested. As he shook his head from the ordeal, Tiny Tim bounded down the slope quickly to meet him. "'Hey, are you okay?' asked Tim. Guy a little shook up, but I'll be okay, he replied. Oh, Tiny Tim, it's so great to meet you. He reached out and grabbed a paw to shake excitedly. His hands were made of glassy beads, his body covered in them as well, and had a smooth, rubbery texture. The marbles covering him were all sorts of colors and patterns, and even his eyes were glassy beads. As he shook Tim's paw, the beads rattled a bit. I'm Marky. My friends call me Marbles. Tim lowered his paw and said, Nice to meet you. Curiously, Tim noticed that Marky's navigator disc didn't seem to be nearby. Did you need help finding your navigator disc? Or have you stashed it somewhere for now? Oh, I, I, I don't know, sir. To be frank, I don't even know exactly how I got here. That struck a chord with Tim, having just had a similar experience. Seems there's a lot more about the cash line he has yet to learn. As Marky was speaking... Tim's ears perked up with his keen hearing, and he heard a noise just over the route, down close to the road. He sat up and peeked over the route, and Marky did the same. Down by the road, there was a human. He was bent over next to the tree line. He must be at the geocache, whispered Marky. It was a warm day, the sun high, and bushes and trees filled with foliage. They couldn't see the geocache itself yet, so watched as the man fiddled around where he knelt. Eventually, they heard the pop of a very large container lid set in place, and the man stood up. He clapped and dusted off his hands from all the dirt and headed down to the road back to his parked vehicle. This was all looking a little familiar to Tim. This area, this curve. He felt like he'd been here before. Marky, seeing the coast was clear to the geocache, sprang up and started fumbling his way on towards the nook where the man was, being cautious to stay in the shadows. And then Tim realized why the scene felt so familiar. This was where the first geocache was placed by Dave Ulmer. This geocache he knew well, but the environment was so different, so natural, fresh, and untouched. What he remembered was an area heavily trampled, lots of dirt, not much grass, another geocache nearby, and close to where the man was, a plaque commemorating the location of that first geocache. This, now, it was like they were the first here. Could it be? Did he really just ride the cash line back in time to May 3rd, 2000? That thought swirled in his little brain, and he forgot that a little marble trinket was bumbling its way down to the very first stash. He tried to remember the cash contents. There was some money, a, a slingshot, computer software, a book, a tape recorder, uh, the movie George of the Jungle, but he didn't recall anything else. Marky, wait, wait! Tim yelled. He jumped up and bounded down the hill to catch up with him. If that was the one and only Dave Ulmer, and this was the day the geocache was first placed, then they definitely should not be adding contents to this famous geocache, even though it was a huge bucket with so much space. Those treasures are well-known and famous, especially that original can of beans. Who knows what could happen if they changed history? This stash led the way to the geocaching they all know and love back home, and there were no marbles in this one. No coins, no army men, no cute little trinkets for the youngest among the humans. Tim closed the distance and took a leap, landing in front of Marky just before they reached the opening where the bucket sat. Marky, this is not your mission, not this geocache. You'll never believe this, but we just witnessed the placing of the original GPS stash. That geocache is perfect just the way it is. Marky's eyes widened. They focused on Tim. They focused on the bucket, just a couple of meters away. Then he looked back at Tim. This was a lot for him to process. How did they get here? This happened way long ago. 
Marky, we have traveled back in time. I don't know how, but we need to leave this geocache as it is. Do you understand? Marky looked back to the bucket, then refocused on Tim. After a couple of seconds of deep thought, he gave a nod. He stepped back and spoke as if only to himself. First I meet Tiny Tim, then I see the very first geocache? I'm losing my marbles! He took a deep breath, breathing out slowly as he looked back to Tim and asked, So now what? Tim needed to know more. Well, first of all, how did you end up here? I haven't seen your navigator disc. I don't have one. I never went through a portal. I was on my way to one for my next mission when I saw you and thought I had a chance to meet you. I was so surprised that I tripped and one of my beads popped off. But I guess you just powered up some kind of gateway and it, and it was rolling right towards you, so I ran after it to stop it. Next thing I knew, I was here, rolling down this slope. Tim realized he must have jumped into his gateway, or maybe he touched him when he jumped. He wasn't sure. All he knew was the hat he was now wearing, the line keeper hat of Sir Maximus, had taken him, them, back in time to the very first geocache. Marky tapped a bead on his chest. I found my marble, though. Tim paused, then started laughing. Marky laughed as well, and the two of them found a moment of humor in their crazy adventure. Hey, want to go take a peek? asked Tim. Marky glanced around. Are you sure? Is it okay? Well, there are no humans around, he said as they looked beyond the road. The vehicle had driven away while they were talking in the foliage. And there won't be another human here for a while. I think we're good to go. The two of them headed to the big bucket, half embedded in the ground, and with their resourcefulness and teamwork were able to remove the lid. They were in Wonderland. For the next, well, who knows how much time passed. They poked around in the container, taking a look at its pristine contents. Neither of them started the day thinking they'd be bouncing around inside the original GPS stash, tapping and playing drums on the original can of beans. It was a memory they would never forget. But time was still traveling, and the time had come to figure out how to get home. They closed up the bucket, sliding the lid back in place, and climbed back up the hill to some flat ground. The two exchanged pleasantries, and then Tim retrieved his navigator disc, still linked to the portal back at headquarters. Marky blinked and looked at it, the arrow pulsing slightly but not moving, and wondering how and why Tim had one. Marky, this is how you get home. He handed him the disc. I've got a mission, and I've got the tools for the job. He looked up at the hat on his head and bounced the white ball at the end of the hat in his scarf. Marky held the disc and smiled. This was the most excellent mission I've ever had. The troops back home won't believe it. Tim remembered Lily and asked Marky, Hey, please find Lily in maintenance and let her know what happened and tell her thanks. Her handiwork paid off perfectly. Sure thing, sir, Marky spoke proudly. You sound like a real trooper. Look for Sergeant Green and tell him Tim says hi. Marky turned around, found a patch of ground, and set the disc spinning. As the gateway appeared, he turned to Tim again and said, Maybe one day I'll be able to join you, to be a line keeper just like you. This was awesome. Tim backed up as the gateway was ready for Marky, and he was feeling the swirl and draw of the cash line. Tim called out to Marky again and said, Hey Marbles, safe travels. And then he stepped into the gateway, glowing white, and vanished in a poof of smoke. Tim sat, all once again quiet, and contemplated the time-traveling of Max's hat, tapping into the mysterious cash line dimension. It was a great power, but a great responsibility. He had to think, what would he do if he were Sir Maximus? Where would he go? Tim sat straight up on his hiney, he closed his eyes and concentrated again on his clearest, fondest memories of Sir Maximus. His brows furrowed even as a wind started swirling around him. In another instant that felt like an eternity, a gateway began to form and blanket him in white as the world whisked away and he was carried off right now.